Welcome to another episode of the PFC Podcast. The opinions you hear are ours and doesn't necessarily reflect anyone else's. Now on to the podcast. Welcome back to the PFC Podcast. This is again Dennis, and today we are doing our TBI roundtable. So I'm going to send it around the room for introductions. I'm David. I'm a uh, neurointensive care neurologist. Jamie, just your friendly neighborhood operational doc. This is Daryl, just 18 Delta. I'm Jay, 18 Delta. And I'm Doug, I'm an intensive care doc. All right, very good. So what we're going to do, I'm going to uh, play the scenario so we are all on the same page, and then we're going to start. We were assigned to train the Colombian military on reconnaissance operations. It was a rainy season, so travel was limited to trucks, ATVs, and good old-fashioned walking. We're about two days into our training mission slash jungle slog when he happened upon a vehicle at the base of the mountain that had been pushed off by a mudslide. When I got to the vehicle, I found an unconscious male with obvious decerebrate posturing. The vehicle at least had appeared stable enough, so I climbed inside to assess the driver. While the team fanned out to look for others and make a litter, I started on the driver. He didn't appear to be bleeding, though he had a nasty gash on the side of his head. He reacted to a sternal rub with some noises. He was breathing spontaneously at 12 deep and regular, but he had sonorous breath sounds. I decided to attempt an OPA, and it went in without problem. His heart rate was 58 beats per minute. His blood pressure was 138 over 88. By then, the team had brought the pole's litter, reinforced with some branches. Thankfully, the fall had ripped open the driver's side door, so after removing the driver's seat, extraction was straightforward. When we got the driver out, I could reassess for other injuries. Other than an obvious TBI, his pelvis was unstable, which I splinted with his jeans and a branch as a windlass. On reassessment, he had a GCS of 6, E2, V2, M2, blood pressure 132 over 86, heart rate 60 strong and regular, respiratory 14 deep and regular, SpO2 95%, room air, and temperature 101.5 Fahrenheit. The captain was on the radio requesting a medevac, but with the weather, the birds would not fly. The roads were impassable with their recent rains and mudslides. Our choices were to hunker down, make a clearing, and wait for the weather to clear enough for the helos, or walk back. We decided it was more dangerous for the patient to walk back. Welcome to Prolonged Field Care. All right, so to kick us off, David, what would your priorities be for this patient? Yeah, so I I think... I think TBI patients are tough because you you get a a patient that you either see injured directly or, or or maybe get a report about the circumstances of their injury and you get to them and there's there's not much that you can that you can tell especially with closed head injury just just looking at the patient TBI is such a is such a catch-all phrase and and everybody knows it when they see it uh, or when they hear it uh, but it encompasses so many different types of injuries and just externally um, observing or evaluating the patient, it's, it's, it's really hard to know what type of bleeds they may have, what compartments that blood product is in, uh, the extent of parenchymal injury. None of that is something that, that you're really able to gauge without a lot of highly technical uh, equipment, and, and that's not available to you in the field. So you have to rely on, on your exam to, to get most of that information. So I think that, I think that you have two priorities um, in, in this patient. And the first is, is that you need to approach a head injury patient the same way that you would approach any trauma patient. Uh, so you need to go through your, your TCCC uh, guidelines and the approach that you learn there. You need, to, you need to do your primary and your secondary trauma surveys because it, it's not going to help your, your brain injured patient if you, if you miss some of these other important injuries. Uh, because you get locked in on the fact that you, you saw them fall off the back of a truck or they smacked their head with something, with something big, uh, or they were in a blast, for example. You, you need to identify penetrating wounds to the chest or any, any bleeding complications that might be occurring. You know, one of the, one of the things that we, we know for a fact is detrimental in, uh, in traumatic brain injury is 
or, or two things really, uh, going back to the, the, the chestnut studies from the 90s is, is, uh, is hypotension and hypooxygenation. And, and those can occur with so many different types of injuries. And if you don't fix those sorts of things first, um, then you're really not going to be able to make much, much headway with some of your, your, more, uh, your more involved interventions like your osmotherapy down the line to, to try to treat uh, ICP if you think that's what's going on. So, so make sure that you, you get a good sense of what's going on with the patient and, and do, that, do that thorough primary and secondary survey. And then you can come back and, and really evaluate the, the patient's neuro injury in more depth. And I, I think that's the second part uh, or the second piece of, of, uh, of, of what needs to be done uh, sooner rather than later in a TBI patient. And you really need to, as best you can, try to determine the, the extent of injury. And, and again, that's, that's pretty tough um, given what, what we led with, uh, the, the, the discussion piece that we led with. But you can actually still get a lot of great information just using your, your neuro exam, your GCS score, and then a, and then a couple of adjuncts that, uh, that we've talked about uh, in, the, in the previous podcast that we're going to be talking about in the, in the CPG. So, and, and let me just kind of, kind of go back to the, the issue about, uh, uh, the question about GCS. And, you know, the GCS is actually the, I think the, the mainstay of, of, uh, of, of a lot of different types of trauma assessments, certainly the neuro assessment. It's something that everybody's going to understand. When you learn how to do it, you can obtain it quickly and easily. And it actually has, um, uh, prognostic value. Uh, potentially, it, 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 and if if nothing else, just the motor piece of the uh, of the GCS score uh, can give you some prognostic information uh, about a patient's injury. They, they've actually done uh, they've actually done some work uh, back in 2011 um, in uh, in Journal of Trauma that had uh, that had shown uh, that uh, you can get a two week mortality based off of the uh, the uh, the GCS the worst GCS score in the first four hours. That you're that you're monitoring a patient, um, so so a lot of good predictive value, but it also helps you establish a baseline, and helps you decide when uh, and and what types of treatments that you want to to institute later. I think that once you get your your GCS score, you can move on to your more detailed neuro assessment. But uh, the once again, I think the keys are are, are a, a thorough, comprehensive uh, trauma evaluation, and then establishing the the severity of your patients, uh, so that you can make treatment decisions based off of that. The severity of the head injury. I'm going to echo what one thing that David said from an operational standpoint. The biggest one of the biggest things we see in um, some of the evacuations we've been doing is people who don't do a thorough um, secondary survey. If trauma is severe enough to cause a TBI or to fracture a spine and cause paralysis, it's severe enough to cause other injury as well. And just because you don't see an obvious source of external hemorrhage doesn't mean that there's not a source of internal hemorrhage. And um, and failure to detect that uh, can be potentially life-threatening uh, to your casualties. So force yourself to look for it. Be aware that some of these internal bleeds are insidious. You know, a, a liver laceration can be um, catastrophic if the liver is actually shattered or the spleen is actually shattered, or it can be insidious if it's just a laceration and there's a slow bleed, you know, which is one of the reasons that ser- it's serial fast exams are required for monitoring patients for internal bleeding, as well as, you know, um, your obvious things of mental status and vital signs. So I can't emphasize that enough. Docs, medics who are organizing training, I would write some scenarios and stress that, um, you know, where you put guys in a position where, you know, they're confronted with a big TBI or a big spinal cord injury uh, and and assess, you know, if they're going to make that mistake of uh, missing an insidious bleed or an internal bleed, let them make it in training uh, and learn from it in training. And speaking of uh, patients with multiple injuries our patient in this scenario other than the tbi also he potentially has a unstable pelvis would you guys take the airway he's got a gcs of six and the rule is uh, less than eight then you intubate but he's breathing it's not great but he is moving air Uh, he's oxygenating at 96 but would the risk of potentially losing the airway push you in that direction what do you guys think? So to echo on what Doug was saying, I think there's a couple of things that come into play here. One, obviously, you've got to increase your, your circle of awareness, grow it on the patient, and grow it on the environment, the tactical situation. This isn't just a one-dimensional problem set. Uh, secondary to that, as you do your secondary survey, you're going to get a better understanding of specifics for this patient. 
Uh, I would lean towards being aggressive on the airway. You're in Colombia. It's warm. Uh, the, the ground is very clay-based. It's prone to landslides and flooding. Uh, depending on where you do your hunker down site, you have to move rapidly. What are the potential outcomes if you move this guy without securing that airway? I think it uh, pushes with pretty negative prognosis if you're not aggressive in managing that. So uh, those are the two things uh, primarily that I would lean towards. So yes, I'd absolutely take that airway, manage it, and secure it uh, immediately. Yeah, yeah, Jay, I, I, th I think I'd agree with you. Um, and you know, from a from a neuro perspective, a lot of times when when we're deciding whether or not we want to uh, we want to innovate a patient. One of the considerations that, that we take into account is, is is what we call airway protection. And um, while he may be while he may be moving air okay right now, is that going to be the case five or ten minutes from now? Because when you think about that volume pressure curve uh, that I, I think we talked a little bit about in the podcast, um, as that as that ICP is increasing, you can see a, a very rapid decline in your patient. And do you want to be trying to uh, to intubate or? Or, uh, or more appropriately, crike your patient when that when that sort of situation happens, uh, and I, I think the answer is no. I, um, I, I think you'd rather have that secure. So I, I think I agree. And then, you know, for down the line considerations, um, while that patient is uh, is is there and is, is moving air well, um, whether or not they're they're actually swallowing, or whether or not uh, you know secretions and saliva is actually going going down in the esophagus, or whether it's going into the uh, the airway, that can create problems down the line for you in terms of uh, in terms of aspiration and such so in a neuro injured patient I, I I think I'd agree and I think I'd be I'd be pretty aggressive taking that airway as well okay so you take the airway um, would you let him continue to breathe through the tube or would you want to provide some kind of ventilation this is Daryl uh, I'd say since you took the airway especially with a I'll go with a, a crike uh, I would definitely help Deepen, uh, having the, uh, the the BVM, and also putting the M on there, so you can start uh, getting some kind of caponography off of it. Since you do have that instrument with you in your uh, in your kit, so you can get the trend of how your patient is actually doing, uh, so you know the next steps that you need to take in order to prolong and hopefully save his life. Okay, um, I guess my next question on that, if we want to start ventilating, is. We know that as soon as we start positive pressure ventilations, you're going to drop his blood pressure. Do we not? Or is that arguable? Yeah, I, um, I don't know that that's necessarily the case. I think a lot of times when you see that uh, after you, you've, um, you've, you've taken an airway, it's, a lot of it has to do with some of the medicines that are, that are introduced. And um, I, I don't think that that's, necessarily, that that's necessarily always the case. It, it, can, be, it can be stable in some cases. Yeah, this is Doug. I, I wouldn't say that um, mechanical ventilation necessarily reduces blood pressure by increasing interthoracic <clears throat> pressure and decreasing venous return. Um, it can, but only if your mean airway pressure is really high. And that we typically see that either with people who are getting overventilated and they're breath stacking and auto, auto peeping, which is where we, you, the chest isn't allowed to relax enough. Uh, and pressure builds up as, as the chest isn't allowed to relax enough, uh, or you just apply high levels of PEEP, um, positive end expiratory pressure. Um, I, I do think that for ventilating the brain-injured patient, you want to avoid high levels of PEEP, which, of course, makes it very difficult to oxygen, you know, to, to treat a brain-injured patient who also has a hypoxic respiratory uh, injury, such as uh, chest contusion, um, but you know, we, we shouldn't dive down too many rabbit holes in these podcasts. So simple answer is, um, don't be a, has, don't hesitate to ventilate. Although if he's breathing spontaneously and his end tidal CO2 is okay and he's not showing signs of herniation, um, there's no need to ventilate. Um, you, you, but you, you want to have that airway there. You want to have it when you need it, not need, it, uh, not, not have to get it when you, when you need it. Yeah, and, and just sort of, this is David again, and just sort of building on what, what Doug was saying, I think the question was specifically about um, about blood pressures, but um, to build on what Doug said about decreasing venous return, in your TBI patient, if your event settings get too high, then, then you can actually cause increases in intracranial pressure um, along those same lines. So if you're not, if you're not draining venous blood from the head, 
that's just another uh, component of, of uh, intracranial volume that that's not moving. So, uh, so you could potentially do that if you're again if your vent settings are real high. But but most of the literature says that uh, that peeps below 15 are, are safe. And uh, and in the <clears throat> acute setting and, and in this patient, it doesn't sound like you're going to need settings that are that are going to be that high or peak airway pressures that are that high. So, um, I, I I would tend to agree with with what he just said. <clears throat> All right, cool. I stand corrected. Um, but in this case, we don't have a vent. We have a BVM with the peep valve on it. I personally, I think I would rather have this guy breathe on his own for as long as possible. But there was two things I was concerned about doing that. One, I thought it, it may reduce his blood pressure. But the other was um, decreasing venous return to the um, to the head. And I I would worry about increasing ICP. Just like um, the original lecture, David had mentioned uh, Thomas Scalia, and in his talk to the um, Baltimore shock trauma, he, he was talking about laparotomies, but he was also talking about thoracic pressures. And in the patient he described, um, she had very high um, tidal volumes, very high pressures, and then Later on in the story, he put her on ECMO so that he could turn off the vents completely to try and reduce ICP. But yeah, you, you definitely you have to control. You're gonna you're gonna have to keep your volumes, your pressures low. So just like on those BVMs, they have that. Even though it's a cheap little dial, you probably should still pay attention to it. Yeah, Dennis. In in this situation, this is Doug again. I'm gonna. Um caveat my recommendation on on ventilation um with a mechanical ventilate mechanical ventilator you know you can pretty much control the volume of air the patient's getting the pressure that it's getting the mean airway pressure unless the patient is breathing over the vent with a bag you are much more susceptible to human error and i can't and, and that is something that actually is really high risk in this situation the I can't tell you the number of times I've been in a code in the hospital or we've intubated and been resuscitating somebody and the reflex for the person on the bag is to give an entire squeeze as fast as they can. And these are, you know, trained respiratory therapists. Um, anesthesiologists are, are, are pretty good. They're, they're usually pretty relaxed in these code situations. But I can tell you that human nature is I'm going to give them a lot and I'm going to give it to them fast. And that's when you squeeze the lungs so full that they never get a chance to relax and you drive up intracranial pressure. So if all you have is a bag and a peep valve, um, consider yourself prone to, to human nature and lay off of it unless you really need it, as indicated by signs of ICP, in which case you are going to want to bag them pretty fast and pretty high volume um, to, to drive down their um, their CO2 as monitored by an entitled CO2, but not that much, as David explained in his lecture on the last podcast, um, because just moderate hypocapnia, moderately low um, below normal CO2 is what you need, is what's recommended these days for reducing ICPs. And maybe, David, you can refresh us on what those numbers or recommendations are these days. Yeah. Um, so, it, and, you know, just to build on what Doug had, had said, it's, um, you know, we used to do this a lot more frequently uh, with, uh, with hyperventilation, and, and it works. Um, it's, a, it's an effective tool for short periods of time while you're, while you're trying to get your hypertonic saline or something else or, or prep the patient for surgery and if, 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 that's, uh, if the circumstances permit. Um, but it can do more harm than good if you're, if you're doing it for prolonged periods because it, uh, it's, it squeezes down uh, on the cerebral vasculature and it, uh, it can cause strokes in, in areas that are probably already uh, starving for, uh, for, for cerebral blood flow. But um, typically, I, you know, I, we, don't use, uh, we don't use anything less than or, or shoot for anything less than 30, and that's probably even getting a, getting a little bit extreme. You know, they, they, they kind of tell you to target the, or normal is between 35 to, to 40. So I'd say between 30 and 35 is an appropriate level to target when you're, when you're shooting for that mild uh, hypocapnia with induced hyperventilation. Um, just one quick question to that. I've heard you will do that for a, a short periods of time. So how long is short periods? For me, it's, it's really no more than 10 minutes. The next thing I'd like to ask is, are you guys good with his blood pressure? Knowing that with his posturing, he, po he probably has elevated ICP, and we're seeing results <laughs> of that. We, he's got irregular breathing pattern. Uh, he's potentially bleeding into his pelvis. So 
Um, are you guys comfortable with his blood pressure, and would you want to do anything for the ICP in this situation? Yeah, so the the short answer is is yes. I think it's I think it's okay. You know the again. We referenced earlier the importance of avoiding hypotension um, in in TBI patients, and and the old data had had actually said that uh, a single blood pressure less than ninety between the time of injury and, and and resuscitation in the ED could lead to a twofold increase. Any single any single systolic blood pressure less than ninety could lead to a twofold increase um, in mortality in, in TBI patients. There's actually some newer data that says that. Shooting for a systolic blood pressure greater than uh, than 110 um, may actually be more beneficial than than just targeting that uh, that greater than 90 number that we had uh, that we'd referenced previously. Um, so there there's probably going to be more and more about that uh, uh, in the not too distant future. But I think that I think that what's important here is in in a high ICP setting, and 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 this is sort of irrespective of, of bleeds in other locations that uh, that may or may not be there that you may or may not know about. Um, what you really want to do is you want to maintain cerebral perfusion pressure. And cerebral perfusion pressure, uh, if everybody recalls, is, is the, uh, the difference between your, your mean arterial pressure, your MAP, and your intracranial pressure, your ICP. Now, we don't have a way in the field to easily measure what ICP is, but you can, you can take your blood pressure and you can calculate a mean arterial pressure. And, and one of the ways that you, uh, that you can actually address uh, high ICP uh, is is to push your map a little bit higher so that you can maintain that uh, that cerebral perfusion pressure uh, and that blood flow to the brain. So this actually is a is a is a good number from from my standpoint. Um, uh, uh, like say, regardless of whether you may have some type of intra abdominal uh, bleed that that's going on, but but certainly from a from an ICP standpoint, from a TBI uh, standpoint, I think that's a good blood pressure. You know, uh, hitting eighteen. This is Jay speaking. Hitting the eighteen delta aspect of this. We're here for an undetermined amount of time in a volatile environmental situation. Uh, we have a limited amount of supplies. We have a limited amount of uh, medical personnel trained to do this job. I think that one, yes, I'm happy with this number. Uh, I'm also been tracking like the 110 is our, our gold standard where we want to be. Uh, the less we do, it gives us more when we need to do it. It's uh, you just can't count on getting out of there. I've sat for you know three or four days waiting to this to have someone come pick me up and. Uh, a bad place to be with limited supplies so i'm going to be aggressive on managing things like the airway but i'm going to hold off on wasting supplies early on when it's an undetermined amount of time i guess my perspective is kind of the same thing but uh what supplies i do have since i am sending this one patient i'll definitely get iv access uh right now same thing for the the crike while we went ahead and took the airway uh, i'd rather have iv access and have the ability to be able to uh push some kind of uh fluid on the individual, whether it be in uh, hypertonic, whatever it may be, uh, or, you know, medication, uh, uh, whatever, you know, I have uh, available to me in my, uh, my kit, but I definitely would have, uh, take IV or get IV access, uh, now before he starts crashing and it becomes really hard, uh, to get, uh, some kind of line on the individual. Uh, this is Doug, and um, I've got bad news that um, when you're managing a patient who's critically ill in prolonged field care in general, and certainly with TBI in particular, you're going to have to do some math. Um, sorry, to, sorry to say it, but I'm going to get it out there right away. Um, you know, systolic blood pressure is, is helpful in terms of, um, you know, sort of general guidelines, uh, as, as David just said. Um, but mean arterial pressure is what your docs are going to be looking for in terms of making some calculations about whether um, uh, their blood pressure is high enough or whether you need to push it either with fluids uh, or even with pressors like epinephrine, which in extreme cases we will actually recommend. Um, so either get yourself a calculator that will do it on your smartphone. and app. There are plenty of apps out there that do it. Uh, or... Um, uh, two times diastolic plus systolic over three is the calculation if you want to, you know, turn your 18 Bravo into uh, a mathematician. Um, the other thing, too, is in terms of exams, um, Glasgow Coma Scale is really what we're looking for here. AVPU is just not specific enough um, to trend a meaningful neurologic exam in the brain-injured patient or even the se severe spinal-injured patient. Um, and, again, there's um, probably fewer calculators out there, but, but get one, uh, you know, put it on your, uh, get one as an app, put it on your smartphone, put it on your tablet. Um, um, if you're traveling with, um, or, and it's definitely written down on the, um, 
prolonged field care flow sheet that's on the website uh, to, to calculate that. Um, yeah, I know I personally am somebody who I like looking at maps more than I like looking at systolics because it's going to take tell me about the entire cardiac cycle as opposed to just the first third of it. But it is a very simple math problem. My real question, though, is does the, does the fact that the patient is posturing, that he has irregular respirations, we know that he's got, he has pressure in his midbrain. Is that alone enough for you to start some kind of hypertonic therapy? Or are you following what the pressures are and looking at what cerebral perfusion pressure could be? So your, your question is, is uh, I, I think broadly, Dennis, is, is when do I use hypertonic saline? Do I use, it, do I use it early? Do I wait for the patient to hit some kind of threshold? And if so, what, what is that? And I think, I think that's a real hard question to answer. Um, uh, and it, it kind of goes back to one of our, our earlier conversation pieces about how difficult it can be to, to really gauge what's happening in, in the brain without, uh, without a bunch of fancy and invasive equipment to, to help you out. Um, the, and this is a question that, that we're actually trying to deal with in, in hospital-based settings, and that's whether or not to, to use this stuff early and maybe prophylactically and induce uh, a, a hypernatremia, if you're if you're talking about using hypertonic saline or conserving uh, that until uh, and waiting until you have um, uh, clear problems with with elevated ICP, um, and whether or not to use it as boluses or or uh, or continuous, um, and 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 a lot of those are are uh, I think uh, practice dependent, uh, provider dependent. But um, you know, in in this case, what I would say is this. Since, since you're probably working with a limited supply of, of, of an osmotic agent and, and hypertonic saline 3% is, is kind of the go-to for us, if you're working with a limited supply of that, <clears throat> I would make sure that you're maximizing all of your conservative measures to address um, concerns for intracranial pressure first. So um, take a step back and, and look at the patient and, and is the, is the head of the bed up to at least 30 degrees? You know, could you raise it a little bit more and maybe get a little bit more venous drainage? Um, is the, is the head and neck in a midline position? Um, is there, is there pain or anxiety and are, are you adequately addressing that? Uh, are they running a fever or, or could they be cold and shivering and could the shivering be, be contributed in ICP or the blood pressure, are the oxygenation okay? You know, have you considered seizing? Go through that. Go through that list again in your mind, and and make sure that you haven't that you haven't optimized um, uh, those sort of interventions first uh, before you reach in and, and grab your your uh, your osmotic agent uh, and start to push hypertonic saline. Um, and if you've done all of those things and you're still worried that your that your ICP is high, then I, I think then is the time to, to really consider administering uh, your osmotic agent. Now, are, are there times when you can just look at a patient and, and you sort of mentioned uh, medullary compression and blown pupils and, and kind of maybe an ataxic respiratory pattern of breathing, and, and you don't have to go through all of those things and say, I need to do this now or I'm going to lose this patient? Absolutely. I think that there are our, our ED docs and, and neurologists and intensivists and neurosurgeons who have all seen that patient in the ED and before any kind of uh, invasive monitoring is implemented, we say give some mannitol or give some hypertonic saline because we think that the pressure is high. So I think that there, I think that there are definitely situations where you're going to look at somebody and, and, and that may be the case. Um, I, I think it's important to make sure that you go through your, through your checklist step by step and, and, uh, and, and fix some of those some of the smaller things first because they can they can actually make a big difference in some cases. Yeah, those are all really good points. And what David was the physiology behind what David was talking about in terms of temperature and pain is that you know conservative you know treatment or easily available treatment for elevated ICP is number one positional right have gravity help you drain fluid from the head. Number two is reduce the amount that the brain is is um, re- reduce the amount of brain activity because increased brain activity equals e- increased demand for blood and increased demand for blood is just putting more fluid in a space that's already getting constricted, right? So we talk about increasing brain metabolism. So what what increases metabolism? Pain does, shivering does, seizing does, and fever does. 
So you want them at a nice, you know, comfortable temperature, but not, you know, if anything, a little bit on the cool, cool side, but not shivering. You definitely want their pain aggressively treated, you know, to the point of, you know, nor, to the point of potentially um, being minimally responsive. And I know that goes against a, a neuro exam, but if you use an agent like ketamine, even as a drip, you turn it right off and you're going to get yourself a neuro exam. So definitely go another good reason to use ketamine in, in this situation. Um, so those are the, those are the basic things. Um, and then, you know, what we don't, is this guy been here? You know, if he's been decerebrate for a long time, he may have such a profound injury that he's not either going to recover if you do administer therapy, um, or, or recover meaningfully. So, um, you know, one thing that if you do put a crike in and you have the ability to hyperventilate and measure that with, uh, uh drive his, hyperventilate his carbon dioxide levels down and you can measure that with your Emma is do a test shot of that. And if it looks like, you know, his posturing improves with a CO2 of, you know, in the 30 to 35 range, like David talked about, and you're like, Oh, he's got some, he's got, he's got an injury that's responsive to lowering ICP. Now I can go ahead and fire the big bullet in my clip, which is the osmotic therapy. And once you give it, you, you do buy yourself some time. I mean, this, ther- that therapy can last from, what is it? Up to six hours, right? A, a single dose of hypertonic saline. So you, you may have as much as 12. It looks like you have two bags. You may have as much as 12 hours of coverage. But so those are some ways to get there to seeing number one, if this guy, um, has an injury that will, can respond to therapy. And number two is, um, get, get there. Okay. Um, one last thing came to my mind about. Uh, resting the brain and that was the uh, sedation podcast that we had done where we where we laid out kind of goals and kind of the how-to of things um, where would you want to put this patient on a RAS scale this is David I, I think um, more often than not I, I, I like to target a RAS a negative one in, in my patients. I think, uh, I think that's a, that's the perfect place to be. Negative one, negative two, um, maybe, but, uh, um, not quite, not quite zero. I think that might be a little bit too high, but, uh, but just below that negative one, negative two, I think is, is appropriate. I got it. Two things. Hey, um, this is Doug again. If we're wrapping up and, and, uh, running Dennis dry and questions, I'm going to add a couple things that I want to make sure, um, everybody remembers first off is the the time course um over which uh elevated intracranial pressure can occur you know this this scenario is very typical or it presents a very typical time course uh where you come upon a guy he's had a big uh a big um uh mechanism of injury um and signs of elevated icp pretty much at the point of injury um, that is not the only way that elevated ICP presents, right? There's immediate and there's delayed presentation. And delayed presentation could be, you know, sort of delayed by hours because you've got a slow bleed and you're just uh, you're just building up blood. Or um, very commonly as well, you get cerebral edema um, that develops up to uh, even days, but certainly 24 hours later uh, because the um, – the area of the brain has a big contusion on it. Essentially, you have a bruise and you have swelling in the brain like you would have swelling on the ankle if you twisted your ankle. Um, and so the, the so what of that is that these patients need, and this feeds into my second point, these patients need to be monitored until they're handed off for TBI. If the, you can't say, because I people ask me this in training exercises, hey, do I still have to monitor this guy for TBI? You know, if you pulled him from a vehicle and his seatbelt wasn't on and the airbag deployed and the windshield is spidered or, you know, the, the uh, he hit his head on, on a side window, You've got to monitor him until you hand him off, even if that is two days later. And we just ran a scenario. We did exactly that, you know, and at the 27 hour point, or actually probably about the 24 hour point for about the last two hours, um, until the medics handed him off, he developed ICP from increasing cerebral edema. So what do you need to do to monitor? At, a, at the very least, you need to be checking and documenting your pupils. Um, are they equal? Are they reactive? Um, uh, uh, or are they, you know, and your warning signs are, are they getting bigger? 
Uh, are they getting dilated and are they getting less reactive? So it doesn't have to be fixed and dilated, but sluggish one, especially relative to the other, is important. Um, alertness, mental state, you know, you do need to monitor that. Do they still know, um, are they still ANO times three? Realizing that hypoxia from hemorrhage or hypoxia from a lung injury can also make them goofy, uh, and less, uh, or, or, or less oriented. Um, so you can't, you can't, um, definitely say that they have increased ICP, but it's still important to monitor because something is going on. Glasgow Coma Scale, I mentioned, you need to be monitoring that. And I like to document it by the individual scores. So I, um, verbal motor and, you know, E4, V5, M6, 15. Um, because, um, I, you know, if you, if you don't give the doc that, he, he or she is probably going to ask you. And that's just a way. And it's also helpful to you to start saying, Hey, I'm seeing, you know, a decline in motor relative to the others. And then the last thing is a very basic neuro exam. Can they move all their extremities, right? Can they squeeze your hand with both hands or give you a thumbs up with both hands? Can they wiggle both sets of toes? That's a, a quick and dirty neuro exam that is going to give you at least a macro view of what's going on uh, inside the brain. Uh, and you should be doing that at a minimum every 30 minutes once the patient's stable, probably every 5 to 15 when you first uh, first start monitoring them. And then obviously if they develop concerning signs, you switch back to more frequent monitoring. I'll add to, add to that as well. You know, you look at what you have in the bag and what you have available with you. Uh, and that's it's that's been drawn up or been said many times in this, this podcast. Don't get fixated on TBI. Uh, so many times people get fixated. You got a pelvic a fracture, hence you, you splinted it best you could. Uh, just like I know Doug has said uh, earlier in this podcast, you know, did he hit the, the steering wheel? You know, you're possibly looking at a hemo pneumo you know, going on in his chest, you know, this is other things that uh, you need to take into account. And how do you do that with what you have available? You know, by bagging, is the bagging getting more, you know, getting more resistance off of that? You know, is it harder to bag the person? You know, these are things that what you have available to you, you know, know the basics. Uh, that's a lot of things that we get away from. We want to get all these, you know, nice items. Uh, the Emma's nice, but it runs off batteries. You know, it's raining. You know, it goes down on you. Know the basics, and off the basics, you can always expand upon. But always look for secondary issues with TBI. A lot of times, like Doug just now said, people will say, hey, can I, you know, be done with this person because it's TBI. You know, what else can I do? You know, always start looking for other things, possibilities that is causing uh, the, the same, it could cause the same, uh, you know, variations in the uh, person's, you know, response to his, uh, you know, Glasgow coma scale to, you know, his respirations to his vital signs and everything. So always keep on digging, especially if this is your only patient, you know, utilize what you have, be conservative because you don't know if you're going to be out there for a couple hours, you know, or a couple of days. So definitely know your environment, uh, know what you have and be ready to react to what you, what you have in front of you. I think that was a great way to end this. Um, just like Jared said, you really have to expand your scope and not just fixate. This is no really different than, say, a burn patient where your eyes are just drawn to that one particular injury. Uh, this patient could easily die from hypovolemia, from the pelvic trauma, um, while you're worried about posturing. Um, you could also go down with hypothermia just as easily. Um, you're in a very wet environment in the mountains. Um, so you really got to expand your scope, your field of view, and there is always something you can do. You just got to be able to maybe take that tactical pause and just think for a second, and it's probably going to come to you. That's another one for the books. Make sure to go to the site, www.prolongedfieldcare.org. Post your questions, post your comments, make your voice heard. This is Dennis for the PFC Podcast, out.